This is What Does It Profit? And I'm your host, Dr. Dawn Carpenter. Each week in this podcast, I'll talk to some of the leading thinkers and researchers, entrepreneurs and executives about things like conscious capitalism, sustainability, and business ethics. Things that feel all the more urgent as we as a planet face enormous challenges, climate change, pandemics, and demands for social reform. Many of these challenges brought about, some would argue, by capitalism. Each episode, each guest, will bring me a little closer to finding out what does it profit. Don't sell her short. My guest today, Bami Quittier, is in the business of short selling, a risky bet that a stock sold will go down in price. When we're looking at companies to short, we're looking at businesses where if they cease to exist, the world would likely be a better place. Fami is one of the world's youngest high-profile hedge fund managers and the founder of Safke Capital, a woman-run short-only fund named after the Egyptian goddess of mathematics and wisdom. She rose to fame in the 2018 Netflix documentary Dirty Money, where she slammed valiant pharmaceuticals. She has her eyes set now on Wirecard, a German financial technology firm. Bami joins me to discuss the ethical side of short selling and how the practice matches with her values. Kwame Fadir, our short selling info trader, welcome to What Does It Profit podcast. Yes, my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Am I allowed to call you the assassin? <laughs> you may. Well, for those of you who are not familiar with Kwame Fadir, the assassin, the short-selling hedge fund manager that seeks to make money from finding companies that exploit people, Fami, you are my hero. That's very kind of you. Well, you know, I don't throw them out all that often. Um, and truly, I think what you're doing is um, giving Wall Street a good name. Well, we still have our fair share of negativity thrown at us because I think people fundamentally misunderstand what we're trying to accomplish. But but hopefully today we can clear some of that up. Well, let's start um, by clearing up for our listeners who are not uh, market savvy, let's say, but uh, have uh, all good intentions to see uh, corporate America as uh, potentially a force for good and your unique position in it. Um, I understand, is delivering superior alpha and returns through identifying frauds and uh, doing that through deep forensic uh, research. How do you, well, first, tell our listeners what a short position is. Shorting is just another strategy in the market, and it's as basic as making a bet that stock price will decline. And the, the very bare mechanics of it is that you go to your bank, your broker, borrow shares and immediately sell them on the open market. At some point, you owe your broker back those shares. So the hope is to make a profit, you're able to buy those shares back at a lower price. Uh, there are many ways of shorting and many purposes Regular hedge funds engage in it as a hedging strategy. Uh, however, we do it um, in a more informationally driven way where we're looking to identify uh, what the market might be missing and through our short selling, help there be price discovery and therefore market efficiency. So it sounds like you're really doing a um, a service to the market by um, maybe filling in the holes in those um, perhaps maybe sometimes uh, fantastical stories that uh, investor relations departments want to tell about the uh, beautiful narrative of companies that do no wrong. Exactly. And academic research has shown that short selling is a pretty good indicator of price inefficiency. So as you see short interest rise in a particular stock, investors should be weary um, of perhaps missing something. Uh, well, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk going around now about the Enron of Europe, uh, Wirecard, and the accounting fraud of the, of the decade. Tell us a little bit about uh, how the regulators saw short selling in, in that environment, or maybe even backtrack and tell us about the story of Wirecard. Personally, I, I take issue with the comparisons to Enron. I think Enron was primarily an accounting fraud, whereas Wirecard is primarily a money laundering vehicle. And the accounting fraud was part of covering up that business 
behavior. But what I, I will say about the whole saga is that Wirecard started as a payment processor, basically facilitating online transactions, digital transactions. And it did so primarily in the high risk space. So these types of merchants are generally associated with adult entertainment, gambling, binary options, more unsavory businesses that a traditional payment processor typically avoids. And the reason they avoid these businesses is because the risk of consumer fraud and chargebacks, uh, where a consumer may say that a f- transaction is fraudulent and then therefore request their money back, the risk of these chargebacks are much higher in the high risk space. So Typically, a payment processor that focuses on these types of merchants is limited in size and can't get to become the 20 billion behemoth that Wirecard did at its peak. So that in and of itself was cause for concern. We started our research trying to understand how was Wirecard able to scale, um, achieve the scale it did given the types of businesses it was processing for. And through that investigation, we came to learn that a significant portion of that business is likely driven by money laundering because we we followed the business behaviors, the decisions, the acquisitions they had made in the past decade and looked at that relative to what was going on in, in the anti-money laundering world over the past decade, um, as far as sanctions, focus on terror financing, the implementation of the Mag- Magnitsky Act. And it, it appeared to us that uh, a lot of Wirecard's uh, strategy came down to being able to avoid this evolution in money laundering. And then the accounting fraud was used to, to basically uh, ensure that investors were, were unaware that these sorts of things were actually occurring. Uh, so, so that was the crux of it. But at some point, if, if you're unable to scale the business further, then the, the criminal elements within a business become much more apparent. And that's really what happened with Wirecard. It got to the point where it could no longer access additional financing. It was no longer able to continue on its acquisition streak. And that's really when things start to fall apart. So I think it's a disservice to the amount of work that's gone on here to just say it's it's another accounting fraud, because I think if it was just that, we wouldn't have seen such a precipitous decline in such a short amount of time. Well, it sounds like it's ripe for another episode of Dirty Money on Netflix. <laughs> Probably. And, and, and even more, this is uh, definitely one of the most scandalous shorts that I've been a part of. And I can only imagine over the course of my career, I'll always come back to to what I experienced with Wirecard, um, you know, down to the fact one of the co-founders is currently under the protection of the Russian GRU. <laughs> so it, it's, it's certainly um, very scandalous and it'll, it'll make for, for, good, for good drama one day. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, hopefully it didn't require you to hire any protection for helping to uncover this. If I could have afforded it, then I probably would have hired protection. (laughs) Oh, how come the good guys always get hosed? Well, I tell you, I'm very interested in the letter that you sent to Boffin. Tell our listeners about where Wirecard is located uh, in Germany and and the the regulators and uh, the markets uh, take on all of this. Yeah. So uh, as I was saying, Wirecard is a German company and it trades um, on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. So it's subject to um, Boffin, which is the German securities regulator. Short sellers generally do get a bad rap, but I would say that the US, for example, has a much more mature and developed understanding of short selling and the regulators are also far more aware of the role that short selling plays in in market liquidity, efficiency, et cetera. So when we think back to the great financial crisis, short selling was banned in financials. But when the SEC revisited that decision, they believed uh, it it actually didn't necessarily help the market um, and they wouldn't have done it again. So for, for the German securities regulator, Boffin, to come out 
and in an unprecedented fashion ban all short sales in a single security wire card. It was absolutely astounding. It was bizarre. There really, it left me speechless because Wirecard isn't a consumer financial institution in the, the traditional sense, and therefore doesn't necessarily have any role as far as the greater market stability um, or trust in the financial system within Germany. However, the regulator's unprecedented actions as far as protecting Wirecard perhaps led to a far more negative perception globally of the German regulator. And as we start to see the headlines come out and, and as news progresses relating to the, the fallout from Wirecard, we're learning that the German securities regulator seemed to have had a role that was complicit in protecting Wirecard that goes beyond just willful blindness. They were fully aware of the allegations against the company of the potential money laundering and accounting fraud, and they chose to do to do nothing. And at this point, it's too little too late. In 2005, a little known startup called Wirecard joined the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. The payments processing company soon became a unicorn, eventually surpassing Deutsche Bank, Germany's biggest bank in value and attracting notable investors such as SoftBank. Despite allegations of accounting irregularities over the years, Wirecard grew to become Europe's largest financial technology company, worth $28 billion at its peak. The former CEO of Wirecard has been arrested on suspicion of falsifying accounts. This after the German payments firm disclosed a $2.1 billion hole in its balance sheet. Then in June 2020, it filed for insolvency, finding itself at the center of one of the biggest financial scandals in history. You know, it, it's hard to say how much damage this will do to Germany's role in, in the greater financial system, the global financial system. Uh, I think year after year, we're seeing German banks come under fire for money laundering and very little has been done on the part of the German financial establishment to actually make a difference and, and make a change. So hopefully this is a wake up call and that the, you know, the German public actually stands up and, and demands change. Well, I don't know how, how many radars this gets on um, with your average person, but for those of us who you know, play around in this area and see that um, markets really um, do have a, a, a large impact on society, I, I'd have to tell you, I'd give you the Pulitzer for economic letter writing uh, for your 15-page tome. You said you uh, were speechless. I think you had plenty to say. And if you'll indulge me, I, I think our listeners have to hear this. You close out your letter. I don't know if you would use the word admonishing, Boffin, but um, I would. Unfortunately, that the uh, sequestering of or the stopping of short sales, uh, those, those are my words, not yours, plays directly into the Flourishment of libertine corporate lifestyle where truth is created as an illicit currency, journalists and whistleblowers are demonized, while executives are given free reign to act without fear of criminal enforcement. Uh, well, there has been some criminal enforcement. What happened to the CEO? He was arrested. He's currently out on bail. Um, and other executives have also been arrested. Uh, so it's good to see justice finally being served, but it's again too little too late. And even at in this moment in time, while we see the US DOJ actually considering possible money laundering violations here, the German establishment is still trying to play it off as just an accounting fraud. Basically try to minimize the extent of what Wirecard perpetrated in the market. But I think there are too many eyes on this now um, that the German regulators simply can't get away with it. So you have global interest in what's gone on here. And I think that'll hopefully lead to proper justice. Well, what does justice look like for you? Uh, everyone in jail and the, and the company closed down or is, uh, who's harmed by all of this? When we're looking at companies to short, we're looking at businesses where if they cease to exist, the world would likely be a better place. From our research, Wirecard was providing a platform for some of the worst in the world. And you know that, that ranges from everything from consumer fraud to possibly child pornography. So if these criminals no longer have a vehicle by which to move their ill-gotten gains, 
then the world is a better place. So in a case like this, the only justice served is the business being shut down completely and eliminating the possibility for the, the merchants and the criminals the company was likely serving you know, for, for them to be able to move their money around. So that's what justice looks like. And any outcome that is less than that would be a disappointment. Well, I mentioned the uh, Netflix documentary series uh, Dirty Money just a minute ago um, as this being a, a potential uh, story. That's really how I learned about your work. Um, during the first season of that show, there was an episode called Drug Short about the pharmaceutical company called Valiant Pharmaceutical. And you played a role in that uh, story. Uh, tell us how that worked and uh, how you found out about Valiant and, and how the story played out. Well, I'll start with the more recent news on Valiant first. Um, we were talking just a, a bit ago about accounting fraud. Well, the SEC just fined Valiant years later, well, five years later, a whopping $54 million, which I, I'm being sarcastic. It's like 20 minutes of profits? Right. And, and this is after Valiant was the single greatest loss in hedge fund history, given how many investors got sucked in to the very seductive business model of basically a private equity firm, but a pharmaceutical company. So it just goes to show that in the current market environment, accounting fraud is something that is treated as immaterial and companies get away with it left and right. So as a short seller, we need a lot more than just accounting shenanigans because we can't always depend on regulators to treat that in a properly punitive manner. Um, but that being said, for me, when you have a an established industry like pharmaceuticals and you have a company come in trying to completely uproot the business model and the way the business operates, the the fundamentals of the business, the margins all look completely anomalous within the industry. It's usually done in a way that perhaps is, they may be walking a, a fine line of, of what's ethical or even legal. You mean jacking up prices on life-saving drugs and, and the like? Exactly. Exactly. So, so we, what we started out, the first thing I did was look at Valiant's entire portfolio of drugs um, and see how those drugs performed pre-acquisition by Valiant and post-acquisition. And what became very obvious very quickly is that once Valiant was acquiring these drugs, the, the number of people actually taking those drugs would fall off a cliff. And that's because the prices were increasing so exorbitantly. So the only way Valiant was able to grow was really by continuing to acquire these drugs and repeat this process. So it wouldn't be sustainable. Um, because you can't acquire forever. And at the point I began shorting Valiant, it's, it became clear to me that they really wouldn't be able to make an acquisition of scale. So with these roll-ups, once you get to that point and you start, you, you can no longer have that inflated revenue growth by acquisition, things start to fall apart. And, and that's clearly what happened. So it was clear to us because we approached it from the point of view of this is a drug company. How do their drugs sell? And is the way they are selling drugs sustainable? And it only became a headline far later um, where investors sort of ignored how the portfolio of drugs was performing because they had so much faith in management and the ability to financially engineer the success of the business, uh, which I just feel was misguided. You know, there were some big names in the hedge fund world that uh, bought into this. Yes. And I think as time went on, those investors did say that, that they did miss some of this in their due diligence. It's very alluring to have someone like former CEO Mike Pearson at the helm. People thought of him as an outsider, but really he was an ex-McKinsey guy who knew exactly how to engineer success at the business, but success at what cost and uh, the, the cost being patients and their health, uh, which for the industry is not a long-term sustainable way of operating. 
Why do they call you the assassin? So though I've appeared in Dirty Money and I, I was strongly publicly against Wirecard for some time, it's not my standard operating procedure. Uh, really, where I'm most comfortable and, and where I prefer to be is just behind the scenes, focusing on the investigations, on the really deep research, and collecting as much evidence as we can to be right. So formulating those, those action plan strategies to ensure justice is served in these very dangerous, delicate sort of situations. Uh, so they call me the assassin because of that cloak and daggers approach to shorting. Even with something like Wirecard, the only reason we we ultimately did go public with that short position was because of the short selling ban that was put in place. Uh, so we we really like to do things behind the scenes because I'm not sure if if a hedge fund manager like myself is necessarily the best messenger for this information, because obviously I have a financial interest in what the stock does. So the appropriate messengers are, are regulators, journalists, et cetera, who people look to for getting to the truth. So uh, we, we would rather do things silently wherever possible. Well, I would think that you probably have those regulators and uh, business journalists on speed dial. <laughs> Well, they, they won't always necessarily agree with me, but but smart minds who are approaching the same problems from different angles are always good to know because it can often provide a sense check on our own work. Well, you know, we have this quintessential what does it profit guest question, and I'm going to pose it to you. So if you can put your philosophical hat on, you know, short selling, what does it profit? Profits the financial markets. Ultimately, short selling is about reallocating capital from bad businesses or mispriced securities. So if we can get capital from some of these fraudulent companies that have exploitative business models or that are misrepresenting themselves to shareholders, then that means there's more capital to go to businesses that are providing a service to society. Um, and it, not only that, it minimizes losses that investors will experience over the long term, because fraud can ultimately be one of the largest sources of loss within the market. Well, I think it's an incredible service that you provide. Um, if our uh, listeners want to learn more about what you're doing and we can uh, look at you online, but are there places that you uh, might suggest our listeners go to if they want more information about how to keep companies accountable? Well, I would start with the the letter that I wrote to Boffin because I think what it, it really does is lay out the, the function that of, of short selling. And it also lays out the bits of information that uh, we look for in order to identify these mispriced securities. And all investors, regardless of, of whether you're short or not, if you're long, for example, you should always be concerned about what's the appropriate time to sell. Shareholders in businesses have a lot more power ultimately because they have voting powers within a company. So shareholders should really take advantage of that and of the voice they have to demand better from the companies they invest in, demand greater transparency. And ultimately that, that would work towards the same goals that I'm trying to achieve. Tell us before I let you go about the creation of Softcat uh, Capital. Uh, I love the name, by the way. My first uh, financial firm that I was involved in founding uh, was called EOS Financial Group, which was the Greek goddess of the dawn, which I always said was very narcissistic. But I think yours uh, is even better. Uh, you're uh, named after an Egyptian goddess. Yes. So my first love was mathematics. So I wanted to have a nod to that in the fund, even though we, we were not ha having any sort of mathematical strategy. The way I think is, of course, again, driven by my love for math. So uh, Safket was an ancient Egyptian goddess um, of accounting, mathematics and knowledge. So she seemed like a perfect fit for, for what we were trying to do. 
um, especially being a, a woman only short only fund. Uh, it just it seemed to make sense. Oh, absolutely. Young, powerful, the woman in red. <laughs> Thank <laughs> yeah. you for finding some time to join us in the studio today. Um, we are, are grateful to have you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. This is What Does It Profit? Links to resources related to the issues we've discussed in this episode are in the show notes. Transcripts, reading lists, and lists of our friends can be found at whatdoesitprofitpodcast.com. In our next episode, we are talking corporate politics. No, not the kind of corporate politics that leads to backstabbing and corporate climbing, but real politics, election style. We will find out how it's done, and more importantly, we are going to find out how it's being done in our own portfolios. I think fundamentally my role is to help encourage more people to take part in the political process. So I'm really excited about this podcast because I do think there's a very strong intersection between the important role that organizations have, companies have in uh, obviously offering products and services to the market or to their consumers and also the ways in which they can participate, you know, in the political process as well. In the meantime, please rate and review us on wherever you're listening and let your friends know about the show. Quick sharing links can be found on our website. Ratings, reviews, and subscriptions on your favorite podcast platform mean so much to us. We would love to hear from you. Show ideas and comments are always welcome. Follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at WDIP Podcast. What Does It Profit is written and hosted by me, Dr. Dawn Carpenter. The show is produced by Jordan Gaspore. Executive producers are Nate Toby and Barbara Landis. And special thanks to our talented interns, Nate, Niels, Hannah, and Andrew, and our friends at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business, the Kalmanovitz Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor, Business for Impact, the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation, the DC Chapter of Conscious Capitalism, and Switching Board Studios. Before I let you go, let me remind you to never stop asking yourself, what does it profit?